റെക്കോർഡ് വർക്കിംഗ് ഐ ക്യു എസ് സി സംഘടിപ്പിച്ചിരിക്കുന്ന അഗോറ വെബിനാർ സീരീസിന്റെ ഇരുപത്തിരണ്ടാമത് പ്രഭാഷണമാണ് ഇന്ന് നടക്കുന്നത് ജൈവ സാങ്കേതിക വിദ്യ വിപ്ലവത്തിന് നേതൃത്വം കൊടുക്കുന്ന ഇരുപത്തൊന്നാം നൂറ്റാണ്ടിൽ ഏറ്റവും പ്രസക്തമാകാവുന്ന ഒരു വിഷയമാണ് കേരള സർവകലാശാലയിലെ പ്രൊഫസറായിട്ടുള്ള ഡോക്ടർ ബിജുകുമാർ സാർ ഇന്ന് നമ്മുടെ മുന്നിൽ അവതരിപ്പിക്കുന്നത് ഹ്യൂമൻ എവല്യൂഷൻ ആൻഡ് മൈഗ്രേഷൻ ദ സ്റ്റോറി ഇസ് ടോൾഡ് ബൈ ഡി എൻ എ ഡി എൻ എയുടെ രാസഘടന കണ്ടെത്തിയതോടെയാണ് തന്മാത്ര ജീവശാസ്ത്രത്തിലെ മോളിക്കുലർ ബയോളജിയിൽ വൻ വിപ്ലവം തന്നെ അരങ്ങേറിയത് തന്മാത്ര ജീവശാസ്ത്രത്തിലുണ്ടായ ഇരുപത്തൊന്നാം നൂറ്റാണ്ടിലുണ്ടായ വളർച്ച ഒരു ജീവിയിൽ നിന്ന് ജീനുകൾ മുറിച്ചെടുത്ത് മറ്റൊന്നിൽ സന്നിവേശിപ്പിക്കുന്നതിനും പ്രവർത്തനക്ഷമമാക്കുന്നതിനുമുള്ള ജൈവ സാങ്കേതിക വിദ്യ സാധ്യമാക്കി തീർത്തു എന്നാണ് ബയോടെക്നോളജി അപ്പം ജനിതക പരിഷ്കരണത്തിന് വിധേയമായ ജീവജാലങ്ങൾ പിന്നീട് പിറവിയെടുക്കുന്ന കാഴ്ചയാണ് നാം പിന്നീട് കാണുന്നത് അപ്പം മനുഷ്യനെ ജനിതകമായി പരിഷ്കരിക്കുന്ന ഏറ്റവും നൂതനമായിട്ടുള്ള ക്രിസ്പർ നയൻ സാങ്കേതിക വിദ്യ ഉപയോഗിച്ച് മനുഷ്യ ഭ്രൂണത്തിൽ എഡിറ്റിംഗ് നടത്തി ചൈനീസ് ശാസ്ത്രജ്ഞനായിട്ടുള്ള ഹി ജി ആൻ ഗി വലിയ ഒരു വിപ്ലവം ഇന്ന് സൃഷ്ടിച്ചിരിക്കുന്നു എന്നതാണ് അതായത് നമുക്ക് ഡിസൈൻ ചെയ്യാവുന്ന ബേബികളെ സൃഷ്ടിക്കാൻ കഴിയുന്നു എയ്ഡ്സിനെ പ്രതിരോധിക്കാൻ ശേഷിയുള്ള മനുഷ്യ ശിശുക്കളെ നമുക്ക് സൃഷ്ടിക്കാൻ പറ്റുന്നു എന്നതാണ് അപ്പൊ അത്തരത്തിൽ ഈ സാങ്കേതിക വിദ്യ ഡി എൻ എയുടെ സാങ്കേതിക വിദ്യ വളർന്നിരിക്കുന്നു പക്ഷെ അതോടൊപ്പം തന്നെ ഒരു ഭ്രൂണത്തിൽ നടത്തുന്ന ഈ ജീനോം എഡിറ്റിംഗ് എത്രമാത്രം മനുഷ്യാവകാശപരമാണ് എന്ന് തുടങ്ങിയിട്ടുള്ള അല്ലെങ്കിൽ പുതിയ ശിശുക്കളെ സൃഷ്ടിക്കുമ്പോൾ അവരുടെ ജനിതക മാറ്റം വന്ന സ്വഭാവത്തെ സംബന്ധിക്കുന്ന ഒക്കെയുള്ള ആശങ്കകൾ ലോകം പങ്കുവയ്ക്കുകയും ചെയ്യുന്നുണ്ട് എന്തായാലും ഏറ്റവും പുതിയ ഒരു നൂതന വിദ്യയുടെ അവതരണമാണ് ഈ വെബിനാറിലൂടെ നടക്കുന്നത് എന്ന് ഞാൻ പ്രതീക്ഷിക്കുന്നു ബിജുകുമാർ സാറിന് കൊല്ലം ശ്രീനാരായണ കോളേജിന്റെ എല്ലാ ആദരവുകളോടെയും ഉള്ള സ്വാഗതം അർപ്പിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് ഞാൻ നിർത്തുന്നു നന്ദി നമസ്കാരം താങ്ക് യു ഡോക്ടർ ആർ സുനിൽ കുമാർ സാർമി ഇൻട്രോഡ്യൂസ് ബിജു സാർ ആക്ച്വലി ബിജു സാർ നീഡ് നോ ഫോർമൽ ഇൻട്രൊഡക്ഷൻ ടു മോസ്റ്റ് ഓഫ് യു ബട്ട് ആസ് എ ഫോർമാലിറ്റി ഐ എം ഡൂയിങ് ദ ഡ്യൂട്ടി വിത്ത് ഗ്രേറ്റ് പ്ലഷർ ലെറ്റ് മീ ഇൻട്രൊഡ്യൂസ് sir dr a biju kumar currently serves as professor and head of the department of aquatic biology and fisheries university of kerala he is the vice chairman of credit and semester system university of kerala he was the former dean faculty of science and director of research university of kerala his research areas include biodiversity taxonomy and ecology biju sir is a member of the international union for conservation of nature IUCN Species Survival Commission He obtained his PhD MPhil and MSc in Aquatic Biology and Fisheries University of Kerala and bagged first rank for MSc He has 29 years of teaching experience in zoology and aquatic biology and fisheries and currently he is also a guest faculty for the MTech Future Studies program of University of Kerala He has also 29 years of research experience in the fields of taxonomy, biodiversity documentation, aquatic ecology and fisheries. He has produced 15 numbers of PhDs in zoology and aquatic biology and fisheries, currently guiding 8 PhD students. Dr. Bidjusar's major research works were funded by DST, DBT, UGC and KSCST. He was a scientific officer in State Committee on Science, Technology and Environment Tech Government of Kerala and served as principal scientific officer and member secretary in charge Kerala State Biodiversity Board. He offered his service to University of Kerala as a Senate member also. He has membership in academic and professional bodies like Marine Biological Association of India, Indian Fisheries Association, Inland Fishery Society of uh, India and the list goes on. Dr. Bijasar is also a founder member of Center for Innovation in Science and Social Action, CISA. And about some awards, he has backed Young Scientist Award by STEC, Government of Kerala. Uh, then Young Scientist Award from Indian Academy of Environmental Sciences and Bangalore University. Good Service Entry from Government of Kerala for the excellent conduct of 14th Kerala Science Congress. 
He was also awarded letter of appreciation from Ministry of Environment and Forest Government of India for successfully implementing the National Green Corps School Eco Club program in Kerala state. He was also awarded highest research grant award uh, in faculty in science and applied science constituted by University of Kerala. A large number of times he has backed best paper awards, best paper presentation awards, and best poster awards with students in various conferences and seminars. Bijusar worked as chief editor of uh, National Science Magazine and currently the chief editor of Journal of Aquatic Biology and Fisheries and offered his service as editor for science magazines and journals and is also a reviewer of a number of reputed journals. And in a nutshell, uh, Dr. Abhiju Kumar, sir, is a science communicator and environmental educator. He has published around 190 research papers and 25 books. Welcome, dear sir, for the 22nd talk of Agora 2021 webinar series organized by Sri Narayana College Column. Over to Biju, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, at the outset, let me thank the organizers, especially the principal, Dr. R. Sunil Kumar, and uh, the team uh, of uh, the Department of Zoology and the College of SN College Kollam, uh, Dr. Jisha and, and other uh, uh, teaching faculty for the invitation. And before I start, let me tell you uh, all the participants, uh, around 279 participants here, uh, that I'm going to talk. I'm not uh, actually, when uh, an invitation was extended to me to talk on Agora, Agora and then I thought of uh, talking on a topic which is uh, rather multidisciplinary and uh, not specifically based on my research topic, but as a science communicator, what I have been uh, trying to tell you is that uh, the future uh, of the world is based on science. Because we are going through a very bad time, uh, the, co uh, the COVID uh, time, and uh, you know the uh, solution ultimately came only from science. Nothing else actually is going to help the mankind. And also this is a time uh, when, uh, particularly in India, we talk in terms of uh, religion, caste, creed, etc and which is of no relevance. Uh, in this talk, I basically am uh, going to tell you uh, how the human beings originated and how go we got evolved into different uh, species uh, across the world and uh, how we migrated to different parts of the world and settled in different parts of the world and how we became black, uh, then white and brown people in, in different parts of the world and how we started following different cultures. We created our own religion and then how, uh, what, is, what is a unifying factor for human beings? And ultimately, some of the future scenarios. What would be the future of mankind? These are the things which I will cover in this multidisciplinary uh, talk. Uh, nothing specifically to do with uh, zoology, but a lot of uh, uh, molecular uh, stuff into this, uh, uh, into this talk. OK, let me share my uh, screen first. And. Uh, Jisha, you could uh, see that uh, the uh, disabled uh, screen sharing is there with me. Sir, I made, I made you co-host. Now it's everything is perfect. Let me see. Dear friends, uh, today I am going to talk uh, on the topic human evolution and migration stories uh, told by uh, DNA. Uh, my talk uh, involves three, four important uh, components. And one in, in the first part, I'll discuss about human origin and uh, the uh, ancient uh, DNA. And in the second part, uh, we, I, I'll explain who are Indians. You know, we, we call all of us Indians and who are all Indians now based on the story is told by DNA. And then what is the current status and future of human beings? You know, there are uh, conflicting and uh, interesting views about the future of human uh, civilization. And then uh, what is actually uh, the things which we can do as a human society uh, to serve nature and serve the mankind? These are the things which I will involve in my uh, talk. So essentially, before I talk about the uh, origin of uh, human beings, we need to discuss about the origin of the entire uh, universe. So all the things began from a single atom and begin and began with a big bang, almost 13.7, uh, 13.8 billion years ago. And that is how with the big bang, the, the universe uh, originated. And if you look at the, uh, you know, the, the position of our earth 
in this planet uh, this is almost like this so in this planet uh, we are uh, the earth the, this is the position of the earth and uh, then we look at the earth the origin of the earth it began almost 4.54 billion years ago and uh, the first molecule of life began uh, on ocean the hot dilute ocean uh, at that period of time almost 3.7 billion years ago and the first human beings walked on the surface of the earth probably 500000 years ago that means uh, you know uh, as as the as uh, you know as, as a species our origin or in our immediate ancestors origin in this planet started only 500000 years ago when we think about the planet and uh, our planet and uh, our universe okay and uh, let us see i am not specifically going into the, the whole history of human evolution but let me start with the discussion about the first hominids or the human like uh, uh, you know the ancestors and our immediate uh, evolutionary family it is com uh, comprised especially the, the the family the group of uh, homo hominoids it's actually a group of primates that include the lesser apes and the lesser apes are primarily represented by siamangs and gibbons and they are called the great apes and uh, and 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 then the great apes include the uh, chimpanzees bonobos gorillas and the orangutans and uh, if you go by the fossil record along with the studies of uh, human and uh, the ape dna it indicate that uh, humans shared a common ancestry with the chimpanzees and bonobos and uh, that means the great apes especially 6 million years ago if you look at the phylogenetic tree you will understand that this is a point in which the humans and uh, uh the other apes uh, got separated and then we can see a separate origin and you can see our immediate ancestors are the bonobos and the chimpanzees and our close related close relatives are orangutans and uh, gorilla and this is a point almost 6 million years ago uh, we got separated from our common ancestor uh, of uh, the bon uh, chimpanzee and uh, bonobo uh, that means uh, we have an independent origin from a common root Uh, from where the chimpanzees and bonobos uh, originated and how do we come to this kind of a conclusion based on the dna story and uh, uh, this is what i am going to tell you okay then how will you understand about the human origin and how the humans originated in different parts of the world and there is no other way but to explore uh, the fossils and the majority of the human fossils are available from africa uh, from where we believe that the first human beings originated okay and if, if many of you uh, uh, learn in your school classes or in uh, the uh, pg or degree uh, zoology classes that the human uh, the the earliest human uh, fossils were uh, from africa and uh, then you can see that uh, uh, our earlier belief was that uh, you know the the uh, first uh, homo sapiens uh, the fossils which we excavated was from the great uh, uh, rift valley of east africa and where we we got some uh, uh, fossils human fossils but the recent studies we got a recent fossil in, in a few years back that is from morocco and then that uh, that region is very very important because that human fossil was almost 300000 years back that means we earlier thought that human beings originated 1.5 lakh years ago but the recent discovery of a fossil uh, the jibal Uh, from morocco uh, 300000 years ago clearly shows that our origin the origin of the homo sapiens is way back almost 3 300000 years ago okay so uh, that is the recent discovery and you can see some of the uh, you know the excavations from africa and all all the things all these excavations uh, clearly reveal uh, from different parts of africa clearly reveal that the human uh, the homo uh, the genus homo it has its origin uh, from uh, 300 to uh, 400000 years ago so oh, this is the uh, uh, the the uh, results based on the excavation of fossils from different parts of africa and then you can see that uh, the if you go by the geological history you know the the major issue uh, defining the human evolution is that the availability of fossils it is not uniform across the world and uh, most of the fossils are now available from africa and uh, thanks to the recent interest in human origin and ancient uh, dna molecule and there are more and more excavations happening in different parts of the world and as a result we are coming up the the scientists are coming up with the more and more fossil records from different parts of the world and more and more fossil records means the science is becoming more and more clear 
the human origin human migration the things are becoming more and more clear okay then how do what we are going to do with the human uh, the fossils once you locate the fossil and then there are a lot of uh, uh, people interested in uh, this kind of a study anthropologists okay the the anthropologists zoologists they are all interested in studying the the uh, the their the origin of the uh, human species the history the history of human origin and of course uh, different anthropological uh, connectivity associated with that so once we get the uh, fossils from uh, or excavated from some of the areas in uh, some part of the world what is going what we are going to do with that okay so the scientists have now uh, create actually they can recreate the entire body out of the uh, sculpture based on the computer imaging programs and also there are uh, different so this is a whole process of excavation so this is a actually herculean task you know we, we need not actually lose anything from the uh, this the, the remains and we have to excavate each and every bone from the area and then we have to reassemble it and then we have to actually recreate the human beings based on uh, the skull or what are the structure available uh, on that thanks to the development of technology a lot of technologies are available which are which enable us to recreate the human beings or the shape of the human beings from the excavations okay so this is how we recreate uh, all these processes are involved in uh, the archaeological science uh, with which we can uh, from the fossil we excavated uh, from the skeleton we excavated we actually transform the whole thing into a human uh, shape uh, with the you know with all this kind of modern technology imaging technology uh, all the 3d uh, dimensional uh, you know structure formations and of course with the help of this plaster paris and all we actually recreate uh, the skull and with the skull we actually recreate the human uh, structures like this so uh, that is how uh, from the skeletal excavations we uh, gradually come up with the uh, you know the shape uh, the recreate the shape with the help of computer modeling okay all these processes are involved when when you excavate a skull and normally you know it involves a lot of uh, uh, the the beautification processes and uh, with, the, with the application of science we just transform uh, based on the skull structure and shape of the uh, each and every uh, skull bones then we recreate the uh, the the structure uh, like that you know that is how uh, we recreate the whole thing but i am going to talk about the interesting result of the dna studies uh, based on a series of studies done across the world especially in the uh, recent past and uh, i urge many of the uh, participants here particularly the biology students and uh, this is not connected with biology alone i i will explain it later and uh, you know uh, to uh, read and understand this book who we are and how we got there got here and this is uh, a book by david drick david drick is actually a professor uh, with the department of genetics harvard medical school and he is a man who actually inspired a lot of studies and he is a man behind uh, you know developing a lot of technologies to extract the dna from the fossils okay and then you know the his studies revealed that the human populations speaking 7000 plus languages and living in different parts of the world they are connected by some way or other and what is the connecting link it is not the caste it is not the religion it is a dna molecule and the dna molecule tells you the story how the human populations in different parts of the world maybe in antarctica or in africa where the life began uh, the human uh, origin began and in different parts of the world Uh, they remain connected okay and the more modern uh, though the scientists actually started comparing the human populations in different parts of the world by comparing the blood groups and that was the initial study but after the development of dna uh, uh, gene sequencing uh, technology genome sequencing technology and now we have a powerful tool and the powerful tool is dna and we have different um, modes of uh, you know if you are a, 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 any living animal we can extract the uh, the uh, dna from the tissues both from the nucleus as well as from the mitochondria and we can sequence it this is not a much a big issue in in the modern uh, technology in modern era of genome sequencing but here the issue is whenever we get a fossil you have to extract the uh, dna the fossil may be 100000 years old and how do you get the dna molecule and this is actually a tricky uh, business and uh, it involves a lot of technologies okay and we have now and this this molecule of dna extracted from the skeletal remains or the fossils are known as ancient dna this is also known as adna and adna is something very peculiar because you are extracting the dna molecule from a speci from a specimen which is more than 10000 years old sometimes it may be 200000 uh, years old 
So how do we do that? And then how do you uh, understand uh, this kind of a, a technique? And, and explain you uh, in brief what is uh, actually uh, done during this process. And uh, in this process, what we need is actually a bone. And from the bone, you know what the problem with this kind of an excavation is that you are getting a bone uh, from a fossil, a human uh, being, a human fossil. But the problem is that we have to extract DNA. And this, remember, this fossil is there in, in the soil for the last uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years then there may be all possibilities of contamination with the bacteria, fungi, and other organisms. That means when you extract, you will get, you will extract the DNA of all the contaminating uh, sources, including microbes, etc. So that means you need a clean room. And then uh, you need a bone which carry the DNA. And in all probabilities, the, the bones which carry the DNA molecule may be the internal ones, where the DNA may be preserved in some way or other. And the scientists now uh, you know, look at the internal ear where we have the the, uh, the ear bones like the cochlear bones and uh, this is one of the sources where you will have uh, uh, you know better preservation inside the body inside the skull and uh, more majority of the scientists now look at this uh, the cochlear bones or the ear ear ossicles and from there they extract the uh, they make it into a powder because it's not easy to extract directly the dna there so they make an uh, the, uh, the the powder and from there the solution is made and from this solution they uh, extract the dna and I ultimately go for sequencing. Then how in the recent past we got this much of information about the human uh, DNA, particularly from the fossils. And that is primarily because of the technology available for extraction of DNA molecule. And you can see that in the last uh, 10, 20 years, what is happening? The, the, the amount of uh, the ancient DNA available is increasing dramatic, dramatically. And now we have more than 5,000, 5, uh, you know, the whole genome, uh, the, the sequences available from the fossils excavated from different parts of the world. And that tells you a lot of story, interesting stories about the human origin as well as migration. And let us discuss that. OK, so that is, you know, this is the region uh, which is no, now normally selected by the uh, the archaeology, the, uh, the, the scientists or geneticists. They extract uh, the bone from the internal ear and then they extract it. Okay, so the ancient DNA is actually the number of uh, 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 the, the the number of sequences made from the ancient DNA is uh, uh, increasing. Now this cannot be done by biologists alone, but this involves a lot of uh, especially when you discuss about the human origin, their migration, etc. You need to combine the science with different other uh, subjects as well, and that is why this is a multidisciplinary subject. When you think about the human origin and migration, you have to think about the origin of languages. You have to think about how the languages spread in different parts of the world and how the the human settlement was there. So you need the support of the historians, the anthropologists, archaeologists, biologists, and linguists. So all the services are taken together when you elucidate the story of the human migration and uh, you know their settlement in different parts of the world. Okay. And the ancient DNA, and what is actually uh, about, uh, something very uh, unique about ancient DNA? So this is, you know, the uh, there are uh, possibilities that you will get good quality DNA from these uh, fossils, especially when it is uh, remain frozen in some part of the world. And then it's we, the, the chances of getting the molecule is more. But the problem with tropical countries like India is that there is a lot of heat here. So that itself is enough for killing a major part of the or removing major part of the DNA from the fossils. OK. And the whole uh, studies of extracting the DNA molecule from the uh, ancient DNA molecule from the, uh, the fossils started only very in the very recent past. In 1995, they got the, the scientists got better results. And uh, thanks to the development of technology, the development of primer, uh, in, uh, particularly in 2007, uh, they, the, the postmortem DNA modification and damage uh, became very, very easy. And in 2009, the ancient DNA studies has been revolutionized with the introduction of much cheaper research techniques, uh, particularly the, the sequencing technologies. OK. And the sci scientists can now extract ancient human DNA from almost 2.4 lakh year old dirt. OK, the dirt available from the human fossil itself is enough. Any, any piece of DNA from the bone, teeth, hair, or any internal body part is enough for extraction of DNA, thanks to the technologies. Then I'm not explaining the technology, but what the scientists now do is they do they follow some medical genomics. So the problem is that the human genome, as you can see, it's represented by three million, three million base pairs, and we don't require any all the things, uh, all the all the genes in human genome. 
so what the archaeologists uh, or the, the scientists uh, working with ancient dna they does is they select the required dna from the human genome okay so they follow the technique in medical genomics they isolate that part of the dna that is most interesting for analysis because they don't select all the genes they select only the genes which are of historic importance okay and then you know they 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 uh, do this kind of uh, uh, the sequencing they what they do is they wash the dna in a series of artificially printed out uh, uh, bait sequences uh, that means they make uh, there is a uh, there is a device called dna printer uh, which will allow you to print the small sequences of dna so they artificially print out uh, the uh, bait sequences maybe 50 liter long atcg uh, sequences and then the liquid dna sample is washed over these baits and these are nothing but the primers and whatever required uh, based on the primer whatever our required uh, genes will stuck to that and they uh, sequence only that kind of a gene so this is the method they follow they they use baits dna baits and select the or isolate the you know required number of genes from the cocktail so they uh, make a uh, primary cocktail of million genes and then wash the dna sample over it and uh, you know the the millions of genes the cocktail carry millions of genes and then uh, we can select uh, selectively isolate the uh, genes which is required for the study of human uh, history and the evolution so this is how from a larger uh, sam uh, sample we isolate selectively uh, the dna molecule with the help of this kind of a bait dna so with this you know the amount of dna available in the in the, the fossil is very very less so we uh, from that actually we selectively isolate the uh, dna molecule required for the study of human evolution and uh, things and like that so you know when you go to the you know the, the process of whole the extraction of dna molecule you know that this is a human cell and everyone uh, of us understand that there are 23 pairs of chromosomes and one uh, come from the pater one is paternal and the other is maternal and this is the double stranded dna molecule and the dna molecule uh, of human beings carry 3 billion pairs of nucleotide and but the letters are only atcg that means our genes carry only these three uh, these four nitrogenous bases adenine uh, cytosine guanine and uh, thymine so that means this is actually the structure so what we are going to do with this that then what is actually even though we get uh, one chromosome from our father one from our mother but even if you get you inherit this uh, kind of uh, uh, chromosomes one from mother and one from father you look you look different from your um, mother and father and why this happens this is happens primarily because of mutation and this kind of random mutation so that means even if you inherit uh, this uh, uh, from uh, the paternal and maternal chromosomes there may be some slight variations and there may be some mutations so the scientists actually look at these mutations and you can see then some in some area there will be uh, small variations or few uh, differences but in some area uh, there are a lot of variations and uh, you know this indicates that so in short time uh, if there is short few differences it shows that uh, the sharing of a common ancestor i e may be 500 uh, years ago that means it's very very uh, recent at the same time when there are longer a lo lot of differences between these two chromosomes it indicates that there is a long term uh, ancestral gene available here with maybe a, a 100000 years ago okay so this is how you know we understand how this looking at the variations or the mutations in uh, the two genes how uh, you know we are connected with ancestors which simply means we get some of the ancestral gene from the uh, from our past that means even if we are living uh, today all of your genes carry uh, you know the ancestral genes which may be billion millions of years back okay that is this is the technique which we use for finding out uh, these differences and in humans about uh, 36 recombination events occur per generations that means when you have uh, your uh, you know the uh, genes inherited from your father and mother in a single generation there are possibility of 36 recombination events uh, in uh, one chromosome but you remember that you have 36 uh, uh, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes and that means this kind of an even recombination even happens in every chromosome okay so the scientists basically look at this kind of a frequency of uh, recombination events and then frequency of ancestral genes available in your genetic material and then compare and if you take a global population and you take different samples from different parts of the world then the comparison is more much more easier and bioinformatics tools available uh, available now uh, makes the comparison very very easy and there are two ways of looking at it one you look at the nuclear genome and that is one possibility and uh, but that is very expensive 
but the more e more recent one and more uh, less expensive one and more precise one is look at the mitochondrial genome and uh, i told you the genome is available in the in the nucleus and the genome is available in the mitochondria mitochondria the advantage is that you know you have a large number of uh, genes and it is single stranded dna molecule so it's easy to look at and also the number of uh, you know this is better the maternally inherited and as a result uh, you know it's very easy uh, to study the, the 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 mutations happening in the mitochondrial dna and that is the reason why in many of these kind of uh, studies mitochondrial dna is actually taken into consideration while we look at the uh, human uh, evolution okay and then another thing there is a general belief including among the zoologists that all our ancestors are from africa okay and uh, and we now know that through the genetic analysis i will come to that later uh, that all the modern human beings actually evolved from africa almost 300000 years ago and that is now very clear and then they migrated out of africa and this is called out of africa hypothesis and then they uh, reached different parts of the world this is the modern theory uh, based on dna explains to you but that doesn't mean that all the people in all the part of the world they are all homo sapiens no and we have uh, the uh, the parallel to the homo sapiens there are neanderthals also which uh, uh, the neanderthals inhabited in the eurasia and they also uh, lived parallel to the hum homo sapiens that means uh, there is also a mixing or hybridization between homo sapiens and neanderthals so that means the genes which we inherit now basically come from homo sapiens from africa and there are some intermixing happened uh, during the migration there was actually cross breeding between homo sapiens and neanderthals and that means the modern human beings also carry the neanderthal neanderthal genes okay this is something which we have to understand and then you can see the, how uh, this kind of a recombination happens uh, many generations after interbreeding as you can see some part of the genes are carried okay and then this is actually the the modern uh, theory says so we have the modern human beings and uh, the modern human beings and neanderthals and the inbreeding occurred be, uh, between the neanderthals and human beings and as a result some of the the, the the modern human beings also carry the neanderthal genes so this is something which you have to understand now and you can see this is how uh, this uh, this is uh, you know revealed through the study of the fossils especially the neanderthal fossils and then cl clearly all these uh, blue lines indicate actually the genes which we got the human modern human beings got from the neanderthals okay so at the same time you remember that uh, the human beings the homo sapiens were much powerful than the neanderthals and uh, due, due to, uh, as a result of competition we totally eliminated neanderthals from the, the the planet okay that is how now we have only homo sapiens as here and uh, you know when the human beings they started migrating from the africa to different parts of the world there were neanderthals also and then there was in the, at this period of time the the cross breeding occurred and the human beings the after cross breeding they uh, you know migrated to different parts of the world and that is the reason why the africans they have the, the pure homo sapiens but the people who actually travel to different parts of the world they carry the genes of neanderthals as well that means you know the eurasians the people in the europe as well as asia they carry 2% of the genes from the neanderthals okay and the modern theory of uh, david reek uh, revealed by the uh, uh, the uh, the the ancient dna study consider three divisions of homo, homo sapiens as of now and one is the modern human beings which is present in throughout the world now in africa europe asia and oceania and neanderthals which is not no more there in the world but there is actually the gene flow which happened from the neanderthals to the homo uh, sapiens and recently there is actually an interesting this uh, discovery denisovans and we don't know much about this group uh, this group of uh, you know the the fossil recently excavated from Uh, some part of siberia which tells you an entirely different story they may be a different uh, kind of human beings existed in that part of the world but as of now we know only very little about that but the studies are coming up to show uh, the different uh, you know their genetic composition okay and uh, you know then there may be a potential unknown home, uh, human hominid also uh, in 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 our planet but and unfortunately because of the lack of uh, you know the the fossil evidences or ancient dna we don't know anything about uh, this group okay and then uh, because of uh, you know the mitochondrial uh, uh, the, the genome study which clearly shows that this is the way in which human beings uh, migrated to different parts of the world that means the original homo sapiens they and other related hominids they appeared in some part of africa 
and then they migrated out of africa and what actually driven the migration we don't know okay the homo sapiens uh, started the journey almost 200000 years back and uh, they they migrated to different parts of the world it never happened all of a sudden it uh, happened in uh, uh, in three possibly four uh, intervals and where different hominids uh, migrated to different parts of the world but all other species except the homo sapiens disappeared because of competition because of you know the the fight with the different wild animals uh, present in that point, uh, point of time and or maybe because of diseases and other uh, you know the climatic events uh, only human beings homo sapiens uh, who are actually much brilliant and smarter than the remaining species they survived and they different they migrated to different parts of the world okay and then what actually driven the migration there are different the theories what actually was a driving force which actually enabled the migration of human beings out of africa this is called out of africa hypothesis and uh, the some of the theories uh, you know related relate that kind of a migration with the climate change also when the climate change became very uh, severe in many part of africa the people were forced to migrate out of africa this is one theory there are contradicting views also about that okay and then homo sapiens as the name indicates sapiens the name uh, you know given by linnaeus says that wise we are much wiser than the remaining hominids and why we we are more wiser because we have a better brain okay and uh, we since we have the homo sapiens have a better brain we have designed the tools and then we have uh, our own analytical power and reasoning power and we actually conquered the world and that is the only reason and then there are some other reasons also which helped in the brain development of human beings and the day from which the human beings started eating meat and we all believe that the human beings are all born vegetarians absolutely nonsense but the study all the study shows that the start the day in which the human beings started eating the cooked meat which was rich in vitamin uh, b3 uh, con containing nicotinamide and then that is actually the triggering point of uh, the the uh, human brain development and development of subsequent protein molecule which enabled the humans to develop a much homo sapiens to develop a much better brain and that enabled us to actually wipe out the remaining hominids and also uh, conquer the world okay and then the you some some of you especially the the, the students ask a question you know what happened uh, with the you know why the human beings the modern human beings have lesser hair in the body okay and uh, you know it all started with bipedalism the day in which the human beings started walking in the two legs uh, especially uh, five to uh, seven million years ago bipedal hominid body hair may have disappeared gradually and uh, it allowed better dissipation of heat through sweating and the development of sweat glands also has to do uh, something to do with the disappearance of hairs and that is another thing and also you know uh, the people uh, the, the the development of the white people in the world we all basically originate as black people in the planet and uh, you know the disappearance of the melanin pigment or skin pigmentation it is almost 1.2 million years uh, ago under conditions of uh, mega drought and actually uh, it actually uh, drove early humans into arid and open uh, landscapes and uh, and then that is why the reason why in 1.2 million years ago under conditions of mega drought when the people were exposed to uh, the open landscapes we developed actually a lot of pigmentation in the body and the people became more and more blacker in order to protect ourselves from the the ultraviolet radiations of the sun and the melanin pigment mechanism the genetic mechanism and the biochemical pathway it became more activated and we produced more and more melanin pigment and then the, when the people started mig uh, to migrate in different parts of the world the skin color uh, you know the decreased especially in the northern latitude and uh, you know in 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 the white the, the so called white people uh, the the whole me mechanism of production of melanin became switched off as a and these people with the white uh, you know because of mutation and uh, these people with the white skin and that is selectively you know uh, then that that naturally that gene got selected during the process of evolution and the white people uh, originated in uh, in the planet and or there are large large number of scientific papers which selectively uh, you know tell the story about the the human uh, skin color development in different parts of the world anyway these are all interesting other interesting aspects when we uh, think about the human uh, migration okay so this mitochondrial dna uh, tells you the story when you analyze the human population in different parts of the world all these things started with the human genome project those who are interested may look at the way in which the human genome project operated 
uh, thanks to the development of uh, gene sequencing te technology, they started uh, collecting blood samples from different ancient, uh, uh, you know, the people in different parts of the world. They isolated the DNA, uh, especially the mitochondrial DNA, started comparing the, you know, the mutations happen and the genetic similarities. And based on the genetic similarities, we can actually create, recreate the story of human migration about, you know, based on the, uh, the biological clock. And the clock tells you very interesting stories. And, you know, when the humans, uh, the, the journey started from Africa almost 100,000 years back, and then the, how do they uh, migrate? And all the red lines indicate the earlier uh, migrations. And you can see that uh, almost uh, uh, 5 billion years ago, the people also started coming through India, uh, through the, the Central Asia. And when you look at the Indian population, it's very interesting. We have uh, all, almost uh, uh, more than 4,600, uh, you know, well-defined populations in India, almost 532 tribes. And out of that, 72 are primitive tribes and 36 are hunter gatherers. Okay. And we speak different languages and the different social structure. And uh, how do we come? And you can see that ancient uh, the human beings are from the Africa. They, make, they came to India almost 600,000 years back. And they came and settled in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And uh, these people are still there. Okay. All these are Indians. And you can see these are the five groups available uh, in uh, this part of the world. Okay. So, in, if you look at the, the current, uh, you know, Andaman and Nicobar populations, human populations, you can see that, and they were all Negritos. That means they carry the African uh, genes with them. And then there are different groups like uh, Greater Andamanese, then Little Andamanese. And there are two other groups, Nicobaris and Shompans, and they have the Mongo Mongolian origin. That means they have a different uh, route of their entry into Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Okay. And then if you look at the mitochondrial uh, DNA analysis, and uh, then uh, you can see that uh, they have a different kind of uh, origins and uh, they come from different parts. So two uh, part, two groups are there. One is the Nicobaris, they have the, the Mongolian origin, and then another group, uh, they have the African origin. Okay. And then this is the way in which they traveled. Almost uh, uh, the journey started 100,000 years back, and they're Finally, they reached India. It's believed that they re reached the Andaman and Nicobar Islands based on the gene studies uh, done in the populations there. It is almost 6,000 years ago, the people came and settled in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Now, the question is, that means earlier, uh, you know, the Indians, uh, they came through this route. And now the question is, how many people or the tribal groups in India share the same genetic, uh, you know, some close genetic uh, uh, similarity with Andaman and Nicobar Islands? The studies done by the, uh, the uh, C central uh, CCMB scientists in India, they uh, show that you know, many of them, uh, uh, these are the connectivities. And uh, the connectivity shows that you know, the, the, there is one group called Rajabanshi uh, in, in North India. They are connected with that. And one group in Kerala called Kurumba, they also share some uh, the characters with the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. This is the current estimate. I'm not going to the current caste system and uh, uh, many details are available. Some are very controversial and I'm not explaining that. So remember that this is one group of tribals which have connectivity with uh, in Kerala which, uh, and in the east uh, coast of India uh, with some connectivity with uh, the, the Andaman and Nicobar tribals. Okay, then what are the, uh, then who are all the Indians now who call, uh, whom we call Indians? Okay. Now, the traditional belief, especially uh, with the Indians, is that we are all Aryans, especially the North Indians are all Aryans. That means the Aryans, they have the people originated in India and they, were, they are expert in, uh, you know, the, the horse uh, riding. And then they later uh, from India, they migrated to Asia and uh, uh, Europe. Uh, this uh, hypothesis is called out of India hypothesis. Many people in India believe that this is, uh, uh, you know, the history, okay, including the, uh, the linguists. And, uh, you know, then they connected with uh, the development of Indo-European languages, including uh, Sanskrit. Okay, they believe that Sanskrit originated in India and then it actually, uh, you know, when the people migrated to uh, Asia and uh, remaining part of uh, Asia and you, then you to Europe, it spreads to that area. Okay, then Aryans, they, they conquered uh, Europe. This is actually the then Harappan uh, civilization in India is also a, something connected with the Vedic uh, uh, period. This was actually the, the conventional belief in India. But the DNA study totally, uh, you know, uh, discard all these hypotheses and tells us different stories. And these DNA studies uh, tells us different stories. And the stories reveal that the, the Indians now, they came through different uh, three kind of uh, migration happened uh, to India. 
I told you about the the ancient the people they who uh, migrated from Africa and settled in different parts of the uh, the uh, India. For the time being, we can consider them as uh, ancestral North Indians and ancestral South Indians. Earlier, it can be connected with Aryans and Dravidians, but the recent study says that you know the South uh, Asian hunter gatherers uh, that uh, they are called the ancient South Indians. They are the oldest people in the subcontinent, and and they are some way or other some part of uh, the population is related with the, the Andaman uh, Nicobar uh, people or Islanders. Okay. and the second group of uh, the the indians actually uh, are the mix with the iranian agriculturalists and that means this is connected with the bactria uh, margiana archaeological complex from where the fossils were uh, you know excavated and compared and then the second group of indians actually come from the irani the the iran the iran they were actually agriculturalists and they came to the the indian continent and then mixed up with the indian already available indian populations there and they actually uh, you know they actually you know the the facilitated the development of agricultural practices in india and third group is very very important they are they come from the the the, the pastures uh, the grasslands in uh, the called steppe and these steppe uh, people actually come from the central asian grasslands and uh, uh, they, they that is actually from north of afghanistan and they, that part is now currently kazakhstan and who were actually earlierly known as uh, the aryans uh, they came and uh, settled in india and uh, you know the people who are now currently called the uh, ancestral north indians basically are the people who come from uh, the central asia or the kazakhstan and uh, you know the mixing of the iranian agriculturalists and south uh, the asian hunter gatherers created the indus valley uh, population okay so this is the current belief based on the the uh, the dna studies i'll come to that later okay and this iranian people actually they uh, mixed with the, the indus valley people and then they migrated towards south okay and then they became the uh, the current uh, the south uh, indian population and uh, north indian uh, the current north indian population more white skin the people basically are the people who uh, mixed with uh, the uh, the people came from the steppe uh, pastoralists who are actually better horse riders and they were better agricultural practices they have all the you know, the uh, uh the the cultural practices which is now followed by the north indians and uh, you know the and they have the uh, north indian groups the the people who are now called ancestral north indians basically are the people with a lot of gene mixing with the the, the people come from the steppe uh, step or the the kazakhstan and then you can see that is the reason why we have a lot of mixed population in india okay and uh, you know when when these people uh, came to india they mixed up with uh, the the culture and then the steppe population especially the grass uh, land uh, invaders they have a priestly caste and culture and then it, uh, the, the 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 sanskrit actually was uh, you know the, the uh, their language the the eurasian language and it also came to india through these people and that is how uh, the, the that is also explained by the linguists here okay and uh, then uh, the uh, what is actually the proof and uh, you know when the sequences are made uh, out of the 140 indian groups and uh, you know many of the north indian brahmins uh, they carry the genetic similarity with the steppe population and uh, which clearly shows that what we call uh, the the north indians majority of the upper class north indians basically are the people who who uh, came uh, from uh, the uh, kazakhstan and the the steppe uh, people and then you know naturally they mixed up with the lot of uh, people here and even uh, the uh, the people who actually with the sepi uh, ancestry uh, the ancestry and then they suggest that there is a mix, mixing of the uh, population uh, of uh, the uh, the eurasia with that but in uh, 4000 year old uh, dna molecule uh, the fossil was actually excavated recently uh, from rakigari uh, in in haryana but strangely Uh, that has more connectivity with the uh, you know the g- g- genetic uh, makeup of the south indians which clearly shows that the people in north and south uh, 100000 years back they freely migrated and then they cross bred and uh, that is why they have a, a different uh, kind of uh, uh, genetic machinery available and uh, this study of david rig is very very important and this uh, shows that uh, you know there is western european uh, foragers or the agricultural people there eastern european foragers are there and they finally migrated and they migrated and mixed with the people in india and then that also that's the reason why at present you know, the, the so called indians 
uh, we see uh, a lot of migrations. So you can see that uh, there is a migration happening uh, from the Kazakhstan region uh, to India, and there is actually a, an Iranian population migrating to India. So uh, we have two kinds of population in India, the ancestral North Indians and ancestral South Indians. Ancestral South Indians have more and more uh, connectivity with the, uh, the African lineage, whereas this ancestral North Indians uh, now has more connectivity with the two group of people, particularly the one group from which migrated from Kazakhstan. And then uh, these people from the Iran, they also migrated and mixed with the North Indian population. And this North Indian population and South Indian population also uh, mixed uh, thoroughly. And that actually gave a kind of uh, a mixing in this kind of uh, Indian population. So in India, in, based on the DNA studies, there are two kinds of population, ancestral North Indians. We may partly call them Aryans. And then we, what, uh, the people in South India, they inherited more genes from the, uh, the African lineage. And as a result, yeah, you know, even in the morphology, they are different. Okay, this is how uh, the stories of DNA based on the haplotypes, uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA clearly explains to you. Okay, so this is how the, the mitochondrial haplotype uh, lineages are drawn in different parts of the world. Details, there are a large number of studies available and you can have a look at it. Okay, and uh, I also request all of you to read this wonderful book uh, written by Tony Joseph. And this is called Early Indians. And which clearly and all it is translated into different languages, including uh, Hindi and uh, Malayalam. And these uh, translations are available, which is uh, written in a rel relatively uh, simple uh, language, not a complex language. And it clearly shows that everyone in the mainland of India today is a mix of different populations. And uh, some pop uh, and this related this related with the West uh, Eurasians. And uh, you know the ancestry is uh, more closely related with the East Asian and the South Asian population. That means no group in India can claim genetic purity. We are actually a mixture of different uh, populations in uh, different parts of the world. And that means if at all we want to call them, uh, call India as, you know, uh, uh, the, the whole philosophy of Vasudeva Kudumbagam, world one family originated from India. And then we are the ones actually can, uh, can explicitly say uh, this kind of a philosophy, the world is one family, because we inherited the genes from different kind of uh, ancestors or the human populations in different parts of the world. Then the question comes, why the population is uh, more homogeneous in the recent past? That means in the last 500, uh, 5,000 years, or rather in the last 200, uh, 2,000 years, the Indian population is completely divided. Completely divided based on caste and creed, and uh, this is our own creation. And this kind of a caste system in India, prevailing in India in, in the last 200, 2000 years, particularly made the, our, our, our uh, populations genetically isolated. Because we actually divided uh, ourselves as Hindus, Muslims and Christians. That's a different matter. But within the population, we have created different castes. And intercaste marriage was not at all prevalent, especially in the last uh, uh, several hundred years. And as a result, each of the castes, they have their own genetic identity. There was lesser amount of genetic mixing. And as a result, there is no more and more homogeneous, uh, uh, you know, uh, the genet gene pools available now in India rather than in China. Because China, the population, the, even though it's a larger country, a lot of mixing happens as revealed by uh, the DNA. And as a result, there is lesser amount of uh, uh, homogeneity in the population. But as far as Indians are concerned, in the last 2000 years, since we created a caste system and uh, the gene pool is limited within the caste system and we have our own uh, homogeneity in the uh, populations. And then he, he, the whole, interestingly, you know, the whole, uh, uh, the caste system, the division of the caste in India, which happened only in the last uh, 3000 years, is based on a, a, a fundamental document called Manusmriti, which is a basically a Hindu law, which is probably originated uh, 100,000 sorry, 1,000 years back before Christ. And it justifies, you know, the caste system based on, you know, the skin color and also division of labor. We divided the people into Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Sudras. And then the, 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 uh, the, the outlier was also created in the recent past in the Indian history as Dalit or outcasts. Okay, the people who are considered as street sweepers or Latin cleaners, etc. And unfortunately, this kind of a system is actually strengthened by the Mughal emperors and then the... the, the the, then uh, the, the British rulers, and they again uh, facilitated. And uh, even though this kind of a caste system was there in India almost uh, uh, 3,000 years back, but it was rather flexible. 
but we made it very strong in the last uh, 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 thousand years our rulers starting from the gupta dynasty we clearly demarcated the caste, caste system and we thought uh, you know started thinking about uh, you know the religion caste etc okay that is a very uh, wonderful story about the indian uh, system and that means uh, if you look at the whole history of human beings uh, how the human beings in the uh, 2200000 years of our history we are all remain connected uh, through only dna molecule and how in the last 2000 years we created religion we created caste and particularly in india we created this kind of a caste uh, system uh, which is uh, no more there in many part of the world and then we created uh, different kind of divisions in the society that's a different story and uh, you know there are interesting sub stories you can create about that i am not explaining that because of the lack of time and uh, you know the, the 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 discovery of the tool system itself actually uh, uh, triggered our development because when we started eating the meat uh, and then it became very very common and that also uh, drove the human evolution and uh, uh, because i told you already the meat how it contributed the protein molecules uh, which enabled our uh, development and uh, the neanderthals uh, diet uh, consists of 80% meat that means we were primarily you know the meat eating people in the in, in the past and then only we became a, a vegetarians in the later part of the uh, our history and uh, you know the modern uh, genetics uh, uh, stories uh, explain many other things for example you look at the hair patterns and uh, the influence of hair tribes if you have a you know a, the eyebrows closed and there is actually a connectivity and if you have a, a gray scare you know the the hair are developing early in your uh, you know life and all are connected now you know the human uh, the the molecular modern uh, you know the molecular studies identify 18 genes that appear to influence the hair traits including the first ever uh, you know the gene associated with gray you know some people uh, you know they gray, gray their hair much early now the genetic stories uh, tells that you know there is a gene specifically responsible for that genetically inherited and that is the reason so now for every human uh, you know character uh, there is actually a genetic uh, backup backup also and then the, the people in in uh, eurasia europe and asia they inherited lot of uh, ge uh, some few genes uh, from the neanderthals and that is the reason why the human the population in this part of the uh, planet are more susceptible to diseases because we got some uh, genes along with the Neand neanderthal genes also and which made the population susceptible and if you look at the you know the way in which we inherit the immunity the people in you know the homo sapiens you can see there is a genetically pure because there is no mixing of uh, neanderthal genes but the people in 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 many part of the uh, europe and asia they have more genes inherited from the neanderthals and that is the reason why and the the population here are susceptible to diseases they are less immune to certain diseases that is also a very interesting study revealed by the mitochondrial dna analysis and haplotype analysis and you can see the people in america they also have uh, you know not the pure america the africans they have the 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 eurasians migrating back to the america american continents and they are also susceptible to a disease so you can correlate with uh, the recent uh, disease outbreaks also so far i explained uh, you know uh, Uh, what is actually the connectivity between the genes and the human uh, origin and the migration it tells you a very simple story that human beings are all have a single origin okay and um, uh, we have a lot of connectivity with the people in africa and then we created our own uh, uh, ways of uh, religion and all if at all there is something to connect the human beings in the planet it is only the dna molecule okay and now what would be the future of human beings and there are a lo lo lot of uh, interesting uh, books available and this is a recent books one of my favorites uh, sapiens by yuval noah harari which tells you uh, three kinds of evolution after in in the in the recent past okay after the human origin and its uh, migration to different parts and first thing he consider the harari considered is the cognitive uh, evolution some kind of uh, the revolution happened in our intelligence and which enabled us to read write and think okay and second is agricultural revolution which finally settled the, the human population in different parts of the world especially along the river basins it happened 10000 years back and the scientific revolution happened only 500 years ago uh, where we use scientific tools to advance ourselves so if you look at the recent past of the human uh, history you will see these kind of uh, revolutions and i am going specifically uh, you know uh, the uh, about the human uh, behavior in the recent past you will see uh, that you know we 
what i actually connect the human population now is only ideas no i speak something i develop an idea i develop a hypothesis i talk to this uh, talk this to different parts of the world and then we all inherit it uh, we all imbibe that and then we develop a different kind of stories so this is the connectivity of ideas that actually made uh, us a single population in uh, in the globe now and even if we spread myths that is also taken uh, care of and that is the reason why we think we created christianity that is how we created uh, islam that is how we created hinduism okay because these are all ideas developed by certain people and there will be a lot of followers and that is how you know the whole history of human uh, civilization tells us and uh, human beings essentially are different from other part of the other, other animals in different parts of the world for example you look at the the, the other animals which form societies look at ants yesterday there was a talk and look at the honey bee colonies you know the there is actually a caste system where the division of labor is there but you know the only thing and there is also chimpanzee there is a well defined uh, social order in the society but what makes human beings different from others is that we tell myths and stories you know we tell about capitalism okay we tell about communism fine It, then there will be a lot of followers and then this is how the human beings we communicate okay and we are extremely flexible we tell what well, the science is highly dynamic as you say uh, this is truth today i am telling you this is actually uh, the truth as revealed by the human uh, dna molecule this is the truth which i tell you today or the the scientists tell you today and then you believe that this is science but when we a new discovery come we actually re redefine truth and uh, truth and this is something which uh, make human beings different we communicate we communicate the ideas and that is how we remain uh, connected uh, to each other okay and that is another uh, revolution which happened in the world for, unfortunately is a religious revolution we created religions uh, based on different uh, faiths and because we uh, nobody said that you know the, the, they have seen the god they only said that i am actually the uh, representative of the gods that we have no gods but we ultimately said that we are the representative of gods and we created and we propagated the story because we were good in telling stories okay uh, and then we created this kind of a physical reality and uh, uh, there is and then imagine reality we have physical reality because we are we are existing today but there is an imagined reality that we imagine that there is something called religion and then we propagated the idea and then we started believing in different kind of the uh, religions ultimately okay and uh, you know the current humans have little knowledge in our own history unfortunately that's a problem when you think about uh, when we think about uh, you know the religion when you think about caste we never think about the past unfortunately that's happening with the, the people who study science as well okay when we think about the religion when we think about the caste and the creed and we never think about uh, the science behind that you but i, I am not uh, saying that you should all become a is this no okay you should not believe in god and i never said that but the problem is that when you think like that you also uh, should be uh, sh up, should apply the common sense uh to think about the history how we came how we originated and uh, what is actually the nonsense we are speaking about religion and uh, uh, caste creed etc okay that is the reason why the study of biology is more interesting because this connects all of us together and there are very interesting uh, studies this is a study which appeared in science the one of the top most journals uh, in uh, science now uh, which tells you how the the societies uh, you know started worshiping fire worshiping uh, the trees and then they uh, from that kind of a uh, belief of uh, worshiping natural forces when the population uh, became more and more we started uh, you know telling the stories about something else which controlled the whole human population then came the leaders actually who preach in order to control the mobs and the society they started preaching about the big gods which will bring a uh, better uh, man to the human society and people uh, started believing in that and this this paper you have to actually read the 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 paper in uh, the science uh, which appeared in 2005 the how the societies got bigger and when the societies got bigger when we have uh, the leaders who tell that you know there is something else called god which actually is actually controlling all of us okay and when the complex societies proceed you know then we started moralizing gods and the societies became complex when the population you know increased and then when we started migrating and settling in different parts of the world we got a lot of free time to think you know this was not the earlier case when we were hunter gatherers we were afraid of the the, the animals surrounding us and when they when we settled and uh, done agriculture i know the food was there uh, ensured and then we got a lot of free time and 
of course that also uh, you know initiated cultural revolution anyway then we started moralizing uh, god and there is an interesting paper by white house sectoral in 2019 which appeared in the journal uh, nature which uh, tells you very interesting stories how the complex societies proceed moralizing god throughout the world history and then uh, how this became established facts uh, when uh, the societies evolved okay and uh, so the, the the science and society actually uh, the religion should can actually coexist and this is an interesting statement by uh, um, john paul ii uh, which clearly says that science can purify religion from error that means you can believe in a religion no issue you can believe in a uh, in religion no issue you can go to the uh, church or uh, temple no issue uh, or mosque no issue but don't believe in uh, superstition because the the, the 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 importance of studying science is that it should actually purify the religion if it is a mistake actually you should be bold enough to say it's a mistake if you uh, it, it is not actually an opportunity to you know spread the uh, you know the the uh, superstitions about uh, many things in the world okay so uh, the in, that also happened uh, with regard to india and homo sapiens are very uh, special unlike other animals uh, we actually do business okay we also created money okay and we also created agricultural revolution and uh, from uh, multiculturalism where a lot of civilizations were there we are actually trying now to uh, you know create monoculturalism that means we are uh, hindus we are christians we are muslim we actually propagated the stories like that that means we are coming to an unipolar we are trying to be uh, be in a unipolar world which never happened in the in the past okay and we are actually uh, speaking about uh, the uh, multiculturalism multiculturalism essentially is actually the philosophy of uh, india as well okay so that means uh, we are not, we are not a pure culture as you uh, as revealed by the uh, genes okay as, as told by the you look at indian food we see that biryani is our uh, you know the culture we uh, you know we are we got this kind of a food culture from different cultures we mix up with the different cultures and that actually enabled uh, given something called the indian food the indian food which we talk about today was nothing indian now because it's actually a mix of different uh, kind of combinations we tried and then we inherited uh, in the in the last 2000 years okay and that means uh, no uh, culture can live as mahatma gandhi said in its uh, uh, exclusiveness it's not you know we you cannot be exclusive you have to think about uh, multiple uh, thing you know the way in which the, we think uh, when uh, we think about human beings we are all fools in some way or other because we believe that we will become immortal by making statues none of the society have become uh, immortal by making uh, statues by spending a lot of money in uh, making uh, structures like this no uh, but, you know it never ha happened with other uh, animals in in this planet we believe that we will become immortal by uh, the, the uh, you know larger civil, uh, constructions like this and this is hollow and also uh, we believe uh, that you know the the uh, greatest challenges are solved by the religion no you look at the largest uh, the incidents has happened in human history look at famine look at uh, the the plague and look at uh, the the wars all of human creations okay and uh, you know the the famine you look at the famine the bengal famine for example the bengal famine was actually the recent studies clearly says that bengal bengal famine was a creation of the, the political system in india when the britishers decided that you know they have to conserve uh, more and more cereals and they have exported it to back to uh, england in anticipation of a war it created the famine in india it's actually a political decision not because of climate change not because india failed to produce more grains now we know that okay and plague and during the time of uh, you know we are now living in the in the world of covid and you know then even the uh, in the time of covid we believe that uh, the the religions and the gods created by us will come as a savior no only science came as a savior and war all the wars are created by human beings just to sell our arms or just to satisfy our ego that is happening across the world and all these things are our human creations and but the 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 the, the solutions actually came uh, from uh, from science only so when we go ahead when we plan ahead what is the solution the solution is very simple believe in science but at the same time you have you can be proud of your culture 
you can believe in your uh, god no issue but apply common sense when you think about the human beings and th there is actually we are all have the same kind of ancestors we are all remain connected but what is the future the future is not technology that is what you know uh, the the scientists also tells you and we have seen in the world of uh, the covid the post covid era we have seen that a single virus particle can actually stop the world from moving and then came uh, the vaccine which we believe that uh, it will save uh, the humanity from uh, all kind of destructions but the neo liberal policies which we uh, follow we ultimately many of the political systems across the world uh, ultimately believe that this kind of an open policy and the neo liberal policy will ultimately help us trade is the secret of success that's a new belief but the post covid era we have to think that this is not the success the human beings if we wanted to succeed as a civilization what is essentially done to be done is to believe in ourselves believe in the human potential believe in our connectivity believe in our relationship believe in our potential to exceed as a single uh, unit we have to actually we have seen in the post covid uh, era that what has helped the mankind to to you know recover from this shock is our mutual dependence our collaboration and that means we have to be more and more compassionate in in future in the post covid era when we have also have to think about what gives the human beings more happiness the way in which we have we can live sustainable uh, life living without harming the nature because we have seen that the, the corona itself or the covid itself the virus itself is actually uh, something of our own creation because we have destroyed the forest systems uh, the, the 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 virus got a chance to mix up with the human population and spread early because we are connected to each other the virus which the which originated in um, in china got spread to different parts of the world because we are actually traveling uh, across the world like anything it's a global village so in order to think about the future one we need to understand that the human uh, species are something uh, you know very unique we are we have the responsibility to save the planet we need to think about uh, the future the only way in which the human beings live as a common civilization is to help each other make sympathy with each other help each other and then understand that what is the you know the wrong things which we have uh, we have done in, in terms of politics in terms of you know the neo neo liberal policies what is done to be done for the future of the mankind is to understand that we can save the planet we can save ourselves from uh, uh, the recent uh, you know the the upcoming extinction only through collaboration cooperation and uh, uh, you know the mutual uh, trust thank you so much thank you bij sir bij sir you have ignited the scientific element inside the human evolution after the talk we do trust uh, pure science more and more i guess uh, the talk was uh, purely scientific wonderful and inspiring uh, shall we move to the next session sir q and a session yes yes sir uh, could you see the q and a box lower panel uh, well uh, there are, yeah 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 if a uh, few questions and uh, one question by adira is how blood groups are uh, compared uh, from fossils you know blood groups are actually not compared from the fossils basically i said how the in the earlier uh, part of the genetic uh, studies uh, the, the 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 blood groups of ancient human beings ancient tribal people across the world were actually compared uh, so that you know the the amount of mutation happening in the mitochondrial dna can be studied oh that that happened before the study of the fossils it is uh, uh, the the uh, i explained that the blood group uh, analysis uh, or the the genetic material from the blood groups uh, were actually uh, compared earlier to understand how the human beings uh, are connected because you know the blood groups are all genetically connected the way in which the blood group uh, are actually transferred is also genetically connected so that is how you know the blood group analysis uh, made a comparison between the human beings across the world okay now we have the fossil uh, dna studies which is much more reliable and much uh, trustworthy okay Uh, uh, another is Aniket Kashyap. Uh, he who explained on on on. Okay. Uh, parallelism between pathogenic evolution with respect to human migration and evolution. Definitely, it's a very interesting story. I am not an expert to comment on that, but 
uh, the recent studies very clearly shows that uh, you know the evolution uh, of pathogen is always coevolution this kind of coevolution normally is uh, it occurs uh, parallel to the human evolution this happens with almost all the pathogens and this kind of a pathogenic evolution may happen it is not always but it may happen also uh, along with the human uh, evolution and migration but the issue is that how uh, we are immune to this kind of a disease it's all uh, determined by the genes if you are genetically immune to this kind of a, a particular kind of a pathogen and then definitely that human population uh, did not contract that kind of a disease okay so that the, the evolution of uh, many of the pathogens are you know very, very along with the human evolution it's actually coevolution but the the question of answering how certain human beings are not susceptible to certain diseases it all depends upon the genetic makeup how you inherited certain genes and how these genes in long term of time through mutations enable uh, the immunity uh, system in in human body and uh, now we uh, that's kind of a natural immunity uh, that that's a question okay then uh, how homo sapiens differ from homo uh, sapiens sapiens and uh, homo nobilis okay so uh, homo sapiens and homo uh, habilis basically uh, differ uh, uh, because they evolved in different uh, 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 part of the world and the genetic uh, mechanism of evolution is something different it's only the you know the splitting at a particular period of geological history which enabled this uh, uh, independent evolution of uh, these two and this is not only two uh, uh, hominids but all the hominoids uh, in, in in the planet at that period of time there were independent evolution but only thing is that all the hominids are genetically connected but the splitting happened at different parts of the geological uh, you know the, uh, the the history of the human uh, race and uh, common ancestor of a primate definitely is a, a tetrapod okay definitely is a tetrapod and uh, you know the the, uh, the tetrapod uh, is uh, the common ancestor of all the uh, primate and uh, the human uh, species and uh, we are the neanderthals more susceptible to so we no 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 uh, the question is uh, we are the neanderthals uh, more susceptible to diseases uh, i don't understand the question but what i explained uh, to you is that the homo sapiens in certain period of our history we have cross breeding with the neanderthals that means the especially the the homo the human population in europe and asia because there is mixing in this uh, after, after the migration from africa and that is the reason why we carried some genes from the neanderthals also as revealed by the genetic uh, uh, studies and some of the genes uh, carry uh, you know uh, the the disease causing genes as well and uh, including uh, ca some cancer form and that is the reason why we are less immune to uh, the the people carrying neanderthal genes are less immune uh, to that that means we carry only 2% of the uh, 2 percentage of the neanderthal genes but yet uh, that uh, is responsible for susceptibility to uh, certain diseases uh, or less immunity uh, that is what i meant yeah rajeshagan sir uh, request to explain something about the kijadi excavation or vaiga river valley excavation uh, i i know something in general about that but not nothing in detail about that okay uh, sorry uh, uh, Bindu L explained connectivity between tribals of Andaman and Kerala because of their migratory path from Africa. Past no, no. Uh, see, the uh, Bindu asked the uh, teacher asked the question about the the connectivity between Andaman and Nicobar uh, uh, tribal people and uh, the the tribal group in Kerala. You know, it is primary it probably uh, because of the migration of the Andaman and Nicobar uh, people back to the mainland. Okay, that is how uh, you know this connectivity came. Uh, uh the not during the initial uh pages uh, stages of migration because uh, you know the, the 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 paper is there in uh, the uh, uh in uh, the, that paper by uh, lal singh uh, lal ji singh is uh, there in the internet so you can search and that paper clearly uh, tells you the story that uh, that migration happened after uh, the, the african population reached uh, Uh, based on the geological uh, sorry the ancient timings or the evolutionary timing and uh, the people from uh, uh, andaman and nicobar migrated back to the mainland and then uh, you know the the uh, that is the reason why you have that kind of a connectivity 
not the direct migration to Kerala or the mainland. Okay. Well, Jinnu you know, asked a question, you know, uh, religion, myths, caste, or uh, science is above all. You know, I ne never said that, you know, the, the everything is answer, can be answered with science. The science itself is a, a, a dynamic uh, thing which, you know, evolved during uh, time uh, with the new discoveries. Even the belief that which we have about the, the Indian population may not be completely true because uh, we have lesser number of uh, fossils available from India, lesser number of genomes uh, totally isolated from our uh, uh, samples, but available evidence clearly says that uh, this is true. But those who really believe that religion and God is true, you just look at the. Uh, I am not. I, I, I am not arguing that you should become, uh, you know, a totally atheist to be uh, uh, to become a scientist. No, you can believe in whatever religion you li uh, like. No issue. But the reality is that you know the. You look at uh, the human origin. It is almost two hundred thousand years back. You look at the origin of all the religions in the world, it is only 2,000 2, years old. Then you think about it with the common sense, what is actually uh, the issue and how the whole uh, issue uh, created. And uh, I am not also not arguing that creating casteless societies will solve this problem. No, no. It's only the human attitude towards uh, you know the, the fellow beings which is going to change the world. And that is the reason why I told towards the end that remaining uh, sympathetic towards uh, your fellow human beings and fellow species in your uh, planet is something the way uh, we have to look at in future, especially in the post COVID era, because even a, a, a new virus can actually totally eliminate the human species from the planet. That is something which we need to understand. Uh, that is something which we need to take care. OK. Uh, by viewing monuments created by ancestors, they are definitely smarter than us, no doubt. Uh, they are smarter than us uh, in the sense that you know many creations came with hand there was no much machines available many of them uh, were you know were our own creations i am not arguing that they were not smart they were smart uh, primarily they were smart and that is why we are uh, we are here okay but they have started uh, you know they uh, have created larger monuments primarily to mark their presence in the world but the modern society also make this kind of larger monuments in order to make us immortal. That is why, you know, uh, we are doing the foolishness. We cannot become, you know, if you have uh, 100,000 uh, crores with you and if you spend that money to make a statue and spend that money to uh, make a, a larger, uh, you know, a, a corridor for nothing in order to, uh, you know, speed up your journey, then that is not the priority in the modern world. That is my argument. The priority in the modern world is actually to make the people more happy, give them all food material to eat, give them all shelter or house to eat, and uh, give them comfort. Because you have a small lifetime and then make the people. So the technology can also make you happy, but that doesn't mean that technology will solve all the problems. Technology will be there. You know, you are going into the world where artificial intelligence is actually the future. Artificial intelligence will actually play a very, very important role. Then our responsibility too is to see that we are not becoming addict addictive to the technology. At the same time, we have independent thinking and belief, and then we make ourselves happy. And doesn't believe that artificial intelligence will make you make us happy. That is actually the argument. Okay. Then uh, explanation on the races of human evolution with reference to the continental drift and plate tectonics. Okay. Uh, entirely different uh, uh, paradigm uh, in that uh, plate tectonics basically you know the human evolution uh, uh, human migration all happened after major kind of uh, the tectonic uh, movements at the same time the uh, there were actually uh, the migrations uh, happened along with the geological evolution also so if you look at the human uh, migration specifically it all happened uh, as a, uh, after the larger continental drift and uh, the tectonic movements and uh, there were only small changes which happened uh, relatively in the geological past. And that is the reason why we cannot directly connect it with uh, the human uh, migration. And if you look at the last migration of human beings into uh, some part of uh, uh, South America and North America, it happened mainly because of climate change and some kind of tectonic movements, which actually uh, you know, uh, uh, enable the human beings to migrate 
to these kind of continents. Not a serious uh, issue connected with the continental drift, I believe. And if you can correct me if I am wrong. And uh, another uh, question from Abdul Razak. Uh, this message has to be disseminated to our society, to the younger generation living in eternal present. Uh, yeah, but I am not speaking specifically about a particular religion, but it is applicable to all the religions. And if you look at the 20th century, we are actually now shifting ourselves uh, uh, in, in, and we are actually trying to separate ourselves in the, in the name of religion and caste. But if you are a true biologist or a, 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 a knowledgeable person, you understand, uh, try to understand our history. That is my argument. If you try, try to understand our history, you will not actually argue in terms of religion and caste. And that is the reason why the human, the modern, uh, the teaching, even the zoology, you know, if you teach zoology, I am, I am sure that none of the zoology classes will deal with uh, this kind of an argument where there is a multidisciplinary dialogue uh, where which involving, uh, you know, the anthropology perspective, linguistic perspective. And if at all uh, this is there, uh, if this is there, then definitely uh, this is going to actually uh, change the way in which we look at uh, the, the ourselves, the human beings at least, uh, you know, where, where we believe that we are all connected together. Um, uh, Rajkumar he has a question, sir. Uh, have you studied the uh, ancient DNA of the cranial and the brain of human uh, sapiens and the Neanderthal fossils other than uh, their morphology? Who is more intelligent between them? See, uh, absolutely no issue. Uh, and there are a large number of studies. Uh, the more intelligent is definitely Homo sapiens. And the reason is very simple. We have a, a larger uh, brain. Um, and a larger skull to accommodate that. All these things are actually a lot of scientific reasons behind that, including uh, the, 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 the day in which we started eating meat and uh, this vitamin B3 molecule triggered the development of a large number of other proteins which enabled the development of brain, which actually triggered the analytical uh, power of uh, uh, human uh, species. Okay. Well, uh, interesting question is another uh, how uh, whether we evolve we evolve further the next step of evolution. Uh, see, this evolution uh, normally happen uh, millions of years in in the gap of millions of years. Definitely, we will evolve. You look at your body and compare it with the Homo sapiens two thousand years back. A lot of changes, and there are interesting uh, studies. If you look at uh, the uh, another interesting book by uh, Harari, Homo Duo. He explains the, another another uh, Homo sapiens called Homo duo, uh, who is actually much much brilliant than us, uh, with a lot of uh, you know the the uh, technologically much advanced than human beings. It is always possible. You look at human posture, you know, the, when you sit long time with the computer and mobile, that itself will create uh, you know the postural changes in human uh, beings, and uh, the exposure to the technology itself will change a lot of part of your brain, and that itself will change. So that means. There is a there, there is an evolution possible, not in the immediate past, but in the uh, in 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 future. There is a possibility of evolution, and also there is a possibility of creation of a lot of uh, human beings uh, by accident itself. You know, because designer babies, your principal uh, uh, explained about de designer babies. Now we the, the Chinese scientists have uh, last year created a designer baby. Uh, you know, but they were it is actually part of. Uh, a, the gene therapy exercise, but still, theoretically, it is possible to create anything now, anything, uh, any living organism out of the uh, DNA molecule. That is theoretically possible. So, because of the ethical, uh, you know, the the restrictions, that is not happening. So, it can happen. Uh, you know, that means you, you can also create an artificial human beings in the near uh, future. That is also possible, rather than the slow evolution, which will take uh, millions of years. Uh, What led to the extinction of uh, Thyagarajan's questions? What led to the extinction of other species of hominoids? A lot of theories are there. For each species, there are uh, specific reasons. For example, major reason definitely is actually the competition. And uh, the, especially those evolved parallel with the Homo sapiens, including Neanderthals. Actually, the Homo sapiens uh, you know, totally eliminated uh, Neanderthals because of fight, because of competition. And then there were actually uh, climate change events. And of course, uh, the, the, the other wildlife also played their own uh, role because they were not smarter as Homo sapiens. That's the reason. 
and of course uh, disease has also played a very important role but we don't know much about uh, you know the role of diseases in eliminating neanderthals etc it, it there is a possibility and there are some theories like that somebody saw a guava fruit in a jackfruit tree and uh, it's uh, god's creation yes you know this kind of uh, you know unexplained things uh, it may be uh, because of uh, you know grafting and uh, uh, you know some other things uh, we need some time to explain and i don't know what is behind that but you know some other things we uh, uh, need to explain we need science need some time to explain all these things and uh, uh, definitely uh, i am not arguing that science has answer to every uh, phenomena in the world no it has to evolve that is what i have to uh, tell you okay thank you so these are the major questions which uh, i try to answer thank you sir the science is not a panacea for all sir shall we shall we wind up this session yes sir yes sir now i request uh, dr divya ps assistant professor of zoology SN College Kollam for the formal vote of thanks. Divya, vote to Divya. Teacher. Ah, okay. Fine. Good evening to all and all. Here we come to the end of today's section of this international multidisciplinary webinar series, Agora 2021, organized by Srinarayana College Kollam in association with IQC. First of all, I take this opportunity to thank our respected principal, Dr. Sunil Kumar sir, who encouraged us to organize this webinar. On behalf of Srinarayana College Kollam, IQC and the organizing committee of Agora 2021, I have immense pleasure to propose a lot of thanks to our 